that needed to be done when I began my career as an air quality scientist, all I had to do was look up. That was 1991. Nowadays like that are rare and skies more often look like this. Our clean air that we enjoy today is nothing short of an environmental and public health success story. Actually, since getting serious about air pollution over half a century ago, the downward trend is unmistakable. Lots of research indicates that that has added years to the average lifespan. Let me give you an example. We started measuring tiny airborne particles that we call PM2.5 back in 1984. Today, levels are a third of what they were back then. Just the drop in the first decade of this century has increased the lifespan of the average Trontonian by half a year and improved the quality of life for three quarters of a million of asthmatics across Canada. So how did we do it? Well, building on progress in the 1960s, the Clean Air Act in the US set standards for air pollutants in the early 70s and Canada did the same. That played a pivotal role in driving down air pollution, sparking a string of policies and improvements in technology that have continued to recent times. Without a doubt, our cleaner air, sparked by awareness and public outcry, followed by government action, has improved public health, resulting in billions of dollars in benefits. That shows us what's possible, but I think that we can and we must do better. The World Health Organization's new air quality guidelines indicate that 86% of Canadians still live in areas where there's work to do on the air quality front. Another obvious way that we need to do better is this. How many of us have bad memories of being stuck in traffic or hesitating to go out because of the traffic? As an air quality scientist though, I think about TRAP, traffic related air pollution. TRAP is a mixture of several harmful pollutants, one of which is nitrogen dioxide. And considering the World Health Organization's recent guidelines, over half of Canadians live in areas where nitrogen dioxide or TRAP still poses some risk to their health. Recent research in Ontario has shown that among people living close to busy roads, 10% of their dementia cases are related to where they live. Now, air pollution is bad on all accounts, but if you're stuck in traffic, I imagine you're not thinking about the air pollution and you're probably thinking about the time lost or the stress. In the 401, Toronto has one of the busiest stretches of highways on earth, and commute times are among the worst anywhere. Going to the Central Business District daily amounts to 10 days over the course of a year, and a whole year over a career of work. That's a lot of vacations or time for other things. Studies also show that for people who commute over an hour a day, they experience 54% more stress and have 44% less time to spend with family and friends uh, compared to people who commute only 30 minutes a day. Now these long commuters also snack 30% more and get 40% less exercise and being overweight is a greater risk factor for premature mortality than air pollution, actually twice as bad. Now we can't forget also that traffic and our supply chain's huge dependence on transportation to bring us the goods we consume is a major contributor to climate change, responsible for nearly a quarter of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions. Now, climate change, greenhouse gas emissions, air pollution, lost time, these are all serious issues, but they're also an indication of a bigger problem, how our cities are designed. And the downsides are real. Relentless development supporting growth of the population of the economy is contributing to sprawl and greater dependence on the car and a myriad of other problems that take a toll on our health, just like air pollution. Other problems include noise pollution, loss of natural ecosystems, and too much pavement. Heat maps for the Toronto area show that the darker surfaces, the paved areas and the rooftops are over 15 degrees warmer than the vegetated surfaces in the surrounding countryside. That's the urban heat island effect, and it will exacerbate the risks as climate change leads to more and more heat waves.
cities are the ones who have to bear the brunt of protecting people as climate change has a greater impact on our day-to-day -day lives. So therefore, they have to adapt to this new reality, investing in neighborhoods, making them more resilient to climate change and more sustainable. If done right in an integrated way, we can address the health effects our urban environments are already having while making progress on our climate goals, including adaptation. So where do we begin? Well, five years ago, I started CANU by bringing researchers all across Canada together. CANU stands for the Canadian Urban Environmental Health Research Consortium. And our mission is to compile and accelerate the use of urban environmental data for health research ultimately to inform urban planning. What I find exciting about CANU is the broad suite of environmental factors available for health researchers to explore. This amounts to common data for every postal code in Canada that are then linked to health data to let us learn more about how where we live, our neighborhoods affects our health. Now we know a lot about what air pollution does, but other evidence from environmental health research tells us that where there's a lack of safe spaces for exercise, more local access to inviting parks and recreation facilities are needed. Where people don't have the opportunity to experience nature, there needs to be more accessible natural green spaces where they can nurture their appreciation of nature and perhaps even reduce stress at the same time. Green spaces also clear the air and reduce noise and help cities become more resilient by weakening the urban heat allen effect and absorbing excess precipitation. And all of these factors affect our health, physically and mentally. And more and more people are realizing the critical role that engaging in their neighborhoods plays in their own and their community's well-being. Yet, somehow these things seem to take a back seat in our busy over-programmed lives. However, when it comes to cities, maybe the silver lining in COVID-19 is that the restrictions have made us all more aware of these things. So could now be the opportunity for us to seriously reimagine our communities so the healthy choice is the easy choice for everyone? This is what our neighborhoods need to strive for, from the urban core out to the suburbs. Everybody, all citizens, need to have more opportunity to choose things like active transportation, like walking or biking, or short trips by mass transit, to satisfy their daily needs. Now, it's not a surprise that some neighborhoods are already better at doing this than others. Toronto and other big cities in Canada have been shown by canoe analysis to have clear environmental disparities where the richer neighborhoods are better at this than the poorer neighborhoods. And of course, no matter where you are on the socioeconomic scale, you want to choose better health. From Fitbits and sleep trackers, the diet apps, we all want to be more informed to make better choices. So I wonder whether or not people can use technology to manage their local environment like they can their personal behaviors. That's what we're trying to do by making canoe data more accessible, easy to interpret data at your fingertips through a smartphone or your computer. Just imagine if we had a map that showed you how your neighborhood and your community supported your health and how they could improve. That's what I wanna to introduce to you now. How we're democratizing data via Canoe's new spinoff, healthydesign.city. Soon, everyone is gonna be able to visualize information in any neighborhood in Canada. And that information is gonna tell them about things that are important, themes, that we know impact their health. Now I'm gonna give you a sneak preview at our healthy design tools. In our healthy place tool, which is gonna be smartphone enabled, we show what it's like within one kilometer for all points across every city in Canada, unprecedented information. Here I show what areas of potentially high air and noise pollution look like across Toronto. The dark brown is where it is higher, and while it is near the busier roads, you can see that it does spread into the neighborhoods. Switching maps and looking at our measure of heat resilience, notice the bright red, particularly on the west side of the city. 
the lighter orange areas, which mean more heat resilience, are near parks and near valleys and larger green spaces, not to mention the cool blue near Lake Ontario. Now let's look at another layer, in this case, access to amenities, which is good because people are able to walk to obtain the things they need or for entertainment and socialization. Being a big city, much of the area here is blue, which means good, but the yellow areas are relatively worse. So let's continue with parks and recreation access. There is more yellow areas, indicating a moderate score, with pockets of low scoring areas that are colored gray. Looking more closely at the circle gray area by zooming in, this is an area we might call the parks and recreation desert. The score is only 15 out of 100. And we see that the larger parks are at the edge of the one kilometer circle, getting too far for many people to want to walk to. Now, last spring, the first place I could get an appointment for my COVID-19 vaccination was here. Not gray, but pale yellow. And there are some larger parks closer that did improve the score. It's now up at 45. From what I saw on the ground walking around, the amenities were good, but the air appeared more depressed with boarded up windows and litter strewn about. Air and noise pollution on this next map were also more in the brown for parts of this area, not surprising given the busy roads. But perhaps most telling was the amount of red when we assessed the heat resilience. We clearly see here an intersection of potential vulnerability to climate change heat and lower socioeconomic conditions. So now I'm going to switch to our healthy plan tool to examine this more closely. The darker the red here, the greater proportion of households in the census low income category with higher than average heat risk. These citizens may be less able to afford air conditioning or other things that they could do to keep cool. There are also greater numbers of visible minorities when I switch maps and show that. That's shown here by the orange and the red areas. Heat wave after heat wave, seniors are often the most vulnerable. And healthy plan shows us where these intersect. So let's cast a wider net around the GTA. And we can see that there are several areas of heat wave vulnerability in the red, meaning relatively less heat resilience and relatively more seniors. Does overlaying these data point towards doable solutions? I think it can help. My examples I've covered where, that is which neighborhoods, need more focus on cooling features like trees or a reduction in dark heat absorbing infrastructure. Acting on this would reduce heat risks, reduce disparities and build climate change resilience. Surely this could be extremely valuable information as we aim to plant 2 billion trees all across Canada. Furthermore, while such changes gain momentum and engages citizens, we can also explore community preparedness and expand public discussion. What's the plan? Do vulnerable people in the neighborhood know about it? And how well will it work? I hope my brief tour of Toronto using our healthy design tools has sparked your interest and that you too can see the possibilities. It's a simple yet pretty big idea. Empower everyone to explore factors in their own city that are important to their health and how they vary from their neighborhoods to their cities and to make comparisons and ask questions. Through this, we can create an impetus for change just like we did for air quality and we continue to do for air quality. Now, earlier I asked, what's the way we begin to make improvements in the way our cities are designed? I covered two things. First, that we should approach problems in a more integrated way and that we should be thinking about the root causes. Canoe is helping us to see what these things might be. Second is to equip citizens with good data and knowledge. HealthyDesign.city has this in mind. The third is to act upon and seize the opportunities in front of us. Now the pandemic has made it crystal clear how critical it is that we satisfy our natural desires to be active outside. And we can do this close to home. 
It's truly for our own well-being, but the benefits will go way beyond there. It's actually a big opportunity. Earlier in the pandemic, when the weather got better, some parks were just bursting at the seams. And park attendance in many cities across Canada increased. And the success of temporary bike-only areas is leading to renewed pressure to create lasting infrastructure for safe, clean, active transportation. So today, we must get serious about reshaping our neighborhoods and our relationship with them, helping keep people healthy as we respond to the pandemic and the next challenges that come our way. 30 years ago, awareness, public pressure, and policy changes improved air quality and achieved a huge step forward for public health. Now, for the sake of our health and our planet, we need to do the same for our cities, and there is no time to waste. The power of data at our fingertips can help us all take charge to ensure more and more that the healthy choice is the easy choice for everyone. I know there's so much desire to just get back to normal, but let's keep the momentum going and accelerate the change to improve health, letting data motivate and guide us towards a new, healthier, more equitable, and environmentally friendly normal, one neighborhood at a time.